Right, um, so a few words about me, and, uh, about the company, and then we'll move forward. Uh, my name is Andrea Panish, I work for the Shayblue as a cloud architect. Uh, recently appointed us to be a PMC member uh, of the project, but I've been involved from CloudStack 4.0 incubating, which is kind of our first version uh, under the Apache umbrella. Uh, interesting different things. In the meantime, I'm also a husband and a father. Right, um, there is no slides about Shayblue in this one, but it's fine. They, they, they are in the. I was finishing some of the stuff uh, at 1 a.m. so. <laughs> That's good. Right, so uh, we are I'm going to give a very quick intro to Ceph uh, about its architecture. Uh, we are going to do a small POC. Uh, some of you who are actually experienced will say this is not the proper way to do it in production, and that will be true. But for a small POC, it will, it will be perfectly, let's say, fine. If it's your first Ceph cluster you build, we'll add it to CloudStack and examine how you can observe volumes from CloudStack, match them on the Ceph cluster, you know, do some. Uh, let's say management around those. Right, so uh, a bit of fun facts if you didn't know uh, from Sage why it was actually called Ceph and a bit of uh, Wikipedia facts about uh, the cephalopods uh, family. They are supposed to be able to fly through the air but I couldn't find any video of that but the Wiki Wikipedia says that so I'll I'll kind of uh, I'll, 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 I'll trust that those those facts. All right, so moving to more uh, IT world. So uh, again, open source software defined solution, if you like, which is meant to be scalable to multiple tens of thousands of nodes. Uh, the whole idea about its architecture is there is no single point of failure, and it should be uh, and it is actually a hardware agnostic. Uh, we say that it runs on commodity hardware. Uh, we don't necessarily say that it performs very well on commodity hardware. Again, it depends what, your, what you consider commodity, commodity hardware to be. Uh, it's meant to be self-manageable, self-healing. If you have a dead drive, dead node, stuff like that, you should be, if everything is configured correctly, sleep very well and not being uh, waken up at 3am like some of us did a couple of years ago. Uh, multiple times. <coughs> so, right, it's uh, built about, uh, around the uh, crash algorithm, which we'll briefly mention. Uh, the whole idea about crash algorithm is there is no uh, file system table alike uh, metadata, so there is no reason to look up where any, some file from the, let's say, VM perspective, VM which is connected to RBD, which is effectively storing its data on the Ceph cluster, the driver, the client side, client side of the Ceph, as well as obviously internal components, they are all crush enabled or they speak the crush language algorithm. The idea is that based on many different input parameters and the topology of the cluster, they can calculate the location of an object. That's the whole idea. There is no lookup table, and, and due to this, it's supposed to be very fast versus you know classical file system where you need to look your meta, uh, your file system table and stuff to see the location on disk and stuff like that. So that's that's the thing to kind of understand. It does provide multiple access methods uh, from the file based method, the block. Uh, let's say level method if you like, uh, which we are going to consume in CloudStack. That's the RBD. Uh, stuff to be explained. Uh, it also does provide the object-based uh, HTTP uh, object-based access, uh, which and it provides compatibility for S3 and Swift protocols. Uh, optionally, uh, it does support integration via third-party software like Ganesha NFS server, so you can expose your uh, Ceph file system via NFS Ganesha. Or there is also um, uh, right. There is also possibility to export this via SCSI and, and stuff like that. So there are a couple of possibilities, but uh, I'm not saying that all of them are very performant. Uh, it's it's obviously uh, subject to testing. Uh, right. So very briefly, uh, the foundation is the actual object cluster. We call it Rados cluster. Rados stands for what you can hopefully read: reliable, autonomous, distributed object store. So in short object store but a nice and and, and uh, well engineered uh, object store uh, no applications clients and staff can ever access Rados cluster directly they always do that via librados which provides api level or api like if you like access to the to the Rados cluster to the object to do objects actually uh, example of those are for example we have a built-in applications like Rados gateway which uh, provides again is affected again with translating S3 or Swift calls to internal Ceph, let's say language if you like, to be able to store uh, uh, S3, for example, objects on the 
Ceph object cluster. Uh, we also have the RBD or uh, the Roblox device um, uh, from Ceph where we are effectively exposing a virtual drive. Uh, you can from the functionality, not technical implementation, from the functionality point of view, you can maybe compare this somewhat to ISCAS in the sense that you are exposing Roblox device to some host or VM, but it's completely different technology and everything. Uh, it's a Roblox device, right? Uh, and we also have a CEF file system which went kind of officially stable, I would say, like maybe two or more years ago, something like that. But yeah, until a couple of years ago, it was not of, uh, considered at least by, by, by the uh, CEF guys officially stable. Anyway, uh, you will have uh, the actual clients on your laptop being, you know, whatever S3 uh, uh, clients using Rados Gateway to store its data over here, just like you do with your Amazon, for example, S3 buckets and stuff. You will uh, mount your RBD either via you, you will consume it either from uh, Kemu uh, via LibRBD, uh, which is a client-side library uh, uh, or client, uh, user-level client, sorry for that, user-level client to actually access uh, RBDs, uh, or you will mount it via, uh, you know, uh, either a kernel client, which I will discuss later and stuff like that, or maybe the... Um, RBD and BD. Uh, clients to CEF file system is obviously either the, the actual kernel client or the Fuse client, which is also supported. Sure. Uh, well, host or, or a VM? I'm um, on the left. Curious. Host VM. Didn't mean that a VM. Well, uh, maybe it's redundant. I maybe should even not mention it. But I'm meaning the meaning of that is physical host or a VM relevant. That's why I put host slash VM. But that's that's right. Okay. Um, great. So again, the the, the Rados cluster uh, is the foundation of, of the old self deployments. Uh, and we have actually three type of demons here. We have object storage demon, uh, which is actually storing uh, the uh, the objects we have Ceph monitors and optionally metadata servers and optionally some other services as well. Uh, minimal technically feasible or technically possible system will have at least one monitor and a couple of OSDs or let's say at least two OSDs because the minimum replication factor is two in Ceph, uh, I believe, right? You, you can you can go to one. Yeah. Okay, you don't want to go to one, but you can go to one. All right, uh, but in production you will always use at least three monitors uh, for redundancy, always odd number of monitors, and you will have at least 10 OSD nodes. I'm not saying 10 OSDs, 10 OSD nodes uh, for different uh, scalability reasons, for less impact when the node goes down, for less impact when data is rebalancing and stuff like that. Something I learned from a video a couple of years ago. So, uh, right, that means roughly 80 or more OSDs uh, for, for uh, optimal performance, the more the better because the data is distributed in the smaller failure domains chunks if your host or a drive fails, much less data is down and much less data needs to be rebalanced. Right, so uh, again, object storage and monitors are mandatory for every cluster while the MDS is or metadata servers is uh, optional only if you are using a file system then you do need to have uh, let's say at least one MDS server, usually two or more. Uh, OSDs again, a couple of ten, up from ten to a couple of tens of thousands. Uh, they are the ones who uh, who uh, serve the stored objects to clients. They also do uh, peer tasks to pre perform recovery, replication uh, stuff, and stuff like that. But the actual monitors, you can say, are maybe considered kind of a brain of a Ceph cluster. The idea is that they maintain a master copy of the Ceph cluster map. That's actually five different maps, but. In sim simp for simplicity, simplicity I, I'm just saying the cluster map. <coughs> They're also managing the cluster membership, uh, uh, the cluster membership uh, state of different components, both other monitors and OSDs, and they use Paxos algorithm for distributed consensus. Um, uh, let's say uh, to, to make a decision who is down, uh, who is not down, if some is reported down, like majority voting and stuff like that. Uh, you will always have a small odd number uh, and these do not serve objects to, to customers. Small number means from in production at least three, like Widow was uh, giving an example in his cluster, maybe in some huge cluster up to seven or so, usually never more than nine because the more monitors you have, the chattier the environment becomes and it's, it's, it, it actually becomes problematic about certain 
certain point. Uh, this is just a kind of graphical sh showing th these are nodes. So these three are here, you know, are, are three monitor nodes that Widow was mentioning in his cluster, and you have a bunch of OSD nodes, maybe a bit too much over here. But uh, that's just to show, and we have obviously a client consuming that stuff. That was very briefly on the architecture and, and, and some of the things about Ceph. Uh, so let's uh, move to a uh, simple POC setup. Again, this is absolutely not something you will do in production. Uh, so we are using uh, the Ceph deploy, which is kind of a very old school tool and has it, it has limited uh, possibilities to do fine uh, granular configurations as you might like it in production. So we'll use probably some Fansible or something like that. Um, right, so a bit of preparation. Uh, time synchronization is critical if you're running on VMs. Make sure that your VMware tools or Zen server tools or something like that, which is synchronizing uh, VM time to the host time, uh, is either working fine and your hosts are really synchronized fine or maybe just use NTP up to you but it, uh, the cluster will complain uh, that's something I uh, in, in all my you know test deployments I, I could see pretty much all the time uh, hostname needs to be uh, resolvable and you also need to uh, support password list or, or or let's say key based SSH key based authentication from what we call the admin node slash deployment node to the cluster nodes which are all the nodes in our cluster. You will need to add a proper uh, repository on that admin node and then from that repository install Ceph deploy tool which is the, pre uh, the prerequisites if you like to even, even start the cluster installation. Uh, right, uh, on that admin node, let's call it admin or deployment node, we will make a folder for storing our, our uh, cluster configuration files and keyrings. We will issue the Ceph deploy new command, which will just make the cluster definition locally on that folder. No, uh, it will actually connect and, and gather some effects, but it will do zero changes on those nodes. You will use the Ceph deploy install command. Now, uh, in uh, with uh, well, this was kind of written maybe two months ago, uh, and up to that uh, point, the you. The Ceph deploy tool was not uh, aware, let's say, of the Nutilus release in sense of using it as a default one. So you do need to explicitly say, I want to release Nutilus just for sake of being, you know, uh, on, on the correct page. And it will, this command will effectively, after specifying obviously the destination node, will only install binaries, nothing else. And finally, we'll create initial monitors. So moni initial monitors are the monitors who are, which are present in the configuration file created by this specific command. So here, effectively, on all three nodes, uh, I will have monitors created. This is, again, POC. Uh, once you have your monitors created, they will be, uh, you know, happy and you have your cluster almost usable, but you do need obviously to, to do a bit of more work and deploy OSDs and stuff like that. So we're going to copy over the, the self configuration files and the needing keyrings from this folder, uh, sorry, from this folder over here, which were generated by the first command. And finally, we will uh, do the self deploy OSD create command using the SDB as our, you know, in POC, just a second volume inside our VMs. I was doing in this obviously inside the VMs. And after that, you will pretty much have your cluster as a cluster working but there are a couple more things to do like creating pools and stuff like that for cloud stack which are going to be covered on i believe on the next slide right uh so something a bit let's say new in the last couple of releases but became really i would say powerful in comparison to previous releases is the Ceph dashboard uh, in previous in mimic release it was pretty much read-only dashboard for displaying some kind of stuff uh, or actually many different stuff but uh, now in Nutilus it's, uh, it's much much richer and you can actually I will give you a very brief demo. Uh, you can actually do a lot of uh, configuration, uh, create pools, images and stuff like that so um, I'll do a quick demo a bit later so yeah, uh, from the new Nutilus release, the dashboard comes as a separate package. It's not anymore part of one of the default packages uh, which are installed anyway. So you do need to explicitly install it. It's not uh, supported currently at, in, in this version of Ceph Deploy. So you need to simply do your YAM install or whatever. Uh, you would, in POC again, uh, disable SSL, enable the actual dashboard module so it's active like, well, it's kind of enabled. And finally, you will create your um, administrator access with admin slash password less like uh, for the authentication later you can use uh, the dashboard to create the different users uh, sign um, I believe this supports also role based access and stuff like that so it, it became really really powerful but before I do the demo just let's continue once you have your uh, Ceph cluster ready uh, you have your dashboard there uh, you will want to obviously create a pool for cloud stack again these are 
really this is really small POC so you know number of PGs and stuff is very small we set a replication factor of three which is probably something you will use in production if you're really brave maybe go to two but usually people will use the three and we need something a bit new in in more recent release we need to initialize the pool and also pay attention there were some questions on the cloud stack mailing lists uh, some of the guys upgraded their I'm not sure, some uh, previous version self cluster to a new one and then the, the client uh, profile was a little bit different, the keywords they have and the, the, simply it's a little bit different syntax to create a um, correct uh, authentic authentication key or, or client keyrings if you like so you need to modify if you're upgrading your install older self installation you need to modify those keyrings uh, and so just keep that in mind that the syntax is now slightly different if you use from some of the older documentation of self the syntax to create it will be inappropriate for uh, cloud stack and you will uh, have issues in, 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 in certain operations this command will obviously give you uh, uh, a key which is shown on the standard output so write that down it's not saved in any file uh, and also what you will definitely want to do is to configure write back cache on kvm nodes which is the uh, librbd write back caching uh, for more obviously uh, on reasons which all of you understand, so for increased performance on uh, writes. Uh, specifically, you would create, create a client section, uh, you would say RBD cache equal true, but you will say RBD cache write through until flush. What does it mean? Uh, older uh, CentOS 6 kernels, which are 2.6.32 uh, something version, uh, the, the Virtio driver in those uh, older operating systems and kernels uh, is of an obvious older version, and it doesn't send proper flushes to the uh, underlying storage device. So effectively, uh, if you're running CentOS uh, 6 on top of this configuration, it will never utilize uh, the, uh, the write back because it will be in the write through, which is effectively no cache. Yeah. So I took a question over there and see how that's that profile RDB when you set the authentication. Uh, so obviously you you then setting the that for the particular pool that you're creating as well, or is that actually uh, yes, this is example for the cloud stack. The, everything I'm, I'm talking about now is a uh, requ requirement to set uh, to add and consume Ceph from the cloud stack. Le a bit later, we will be adding those. So yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so in the newer kernels, uh, again, initially it will be right through until it receives the first flush from the storage driver. When it receives the first flush. Uh, LibRBD will say, okay, this guy is smart enough. Now I will move to write back. So it's only right through until the first flush. Uh, there are some default settings which you can also pick up. Like, I believe it was like 16 megabytes. Previously it was maybe 32 per volume. So if you're running 50 VMs with four uh, volumes per VM, that's 200 volumes times 16 megabytes. That's a couple of gigabytes of more RAM that you need. So if you are doing hyperconverged setup, uh, make sure that in cloud stack uh, agent configuration file you reserve some RAM for the operating system and whatever other services might be running beside the KVM. So that's something to keep in mind to avoid out of memory killer and stuff like that. Right, uh, very, uh, very uh, brief uh, demo. All right, so uh, this is my uh, this is my demo at Ceph cluster. Uh, it's in a health warrant due to uh, my, I have some specific issues with some synchronization once I found and find the mouse. But what I wanted to show over here, uh, you, you have a status of your whole cluster of monitors. Uh, which one are up or down. Uh, there is also a performance section. Uh, now our resolution is not not really great but uh, you you will be hopefully be able to see uh, client IOPS, client throughput and stuff like that but also you have recovery throughput something you want to monitor and throttle so it doesn't affect uh, your client performance capacity uh, let, let's say capacity uh, status of pgs and stuff like that so that's just the the actual dashboard overview in the cluster you can uh, observe your osd nodes uh, you can uh, you know do scrubbing rewaiting um, simply managing osds many different ways observe performance and iops per osd if you have uh, configured properly your ceph cluster you will be able here to see the overall performance which i have not done then you can create pools um, Oops, uh, right. So you can create pools, uh, delete pools, stuff like that, uh, edit existing pools. You can manage block devices, which are RBD images. Uh, this one is already running CloudStack, so you can see like two uh, volumes and stuff like that. Uh, 
Right, so uh, really a lot of uh, different information that you can see snapshots of those and, and, and manage and, and delete those, copy, flatten, whatever. So there's also a possibility once you do a initial preparation to manage NFS Ganesha through this uh, dashboard, uh, file system stuff and, 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 and you know things like that. So again, it's very, uh, it's very powerful, uh, but this is just a very quick uh, demo uh, of that dashboard, right. Yeah, those were just kind of a backup slides in case uh, I have some issues with demo. A bit more complete list of the dashboard changes, which I'm not going to go through, uh, is given on that slide. You can obviously read the release notes and stuff like that, but also a lot of interesting uh, things, uh, including you know multiple users' roles and uh, some authentication, the support for authentication and stuff like that. So really interesting. Uh, a couple of general CEF uh, changes in Nutilus. The previous were the dashboard changes in Nutilus, but these are CEF changes in Nutilus. Again, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there is a, a new, uh, let's say, port used for protocol to, uh, sorry, port used to uh, communicate because of the new protocol version between monitors. Uh, so if you're having like tight firewall configuration, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, failure predictions, optional automatic ma I mean, migration if it predicts that based on the smart parameters that this will fail, uh, stuff like that. Uh, Larvid live migration in certain cases and so on and so forth. So a lot of a lot of different things. Um, right. So now you, that you have your CEF cluster, you need to add it to uh, CloudStack. Uh, you will be adding a primary storage, uh, obviously. And uh, here you need to sell, select the protocol as RBD. Uh, provider default primary, I believe something else is uh, kind of chosen here by default. You need to define your RADIS monitor. I will explain why I put a single IP address, which is not what you will do in production. You need your pool, which we named previously Cloud Stack. When we were creating it, you need your user, which I also named Cloud Stack previously, if you remember when I was getting those client keyrings. And you have uh, the RADIS secret. Again, these two were out the output when I was uh, using that uh, command to generate uh, keyrings for accessing the specific pool optionally tags and stuff like that i will explain monitors just in a second after you have added your primary storage obviously you create your compute offerings possibly with tags and deploy a vm that's probably needless to say uh, for other monitors uh, you will never use the single ip address uh, because if that monitor fails your cloud stack or actually your KVM host will not be able to communicate uh, with uh, with your uh, CEF cluster because uh, these details over here will be uh, used to create uh, a XML definition on each KVM node a storage pool for libvirt and if this fails uh, you are kind of uh, not in a really good shape so you, what you will do here you will use um, because of the of the message signing you cannot really use load balancer so it, it's not supported even on TCP level or any kind of level, unfortunately, that would be a perfect way to load balance uh, access to different monitors. You will use an old-fashioned round-robin DNS. If your monitor fails, uh, KVM will retry uh, other monitors, but the idea is if it fails, just go and, and quickly remove that from your DNS. So still only the good monitors will be rotated in, in the sense of DNS resolution and sent back to KVM. So you will use here uh, your uh, DNS name, not the IP address. Right, uh, so let's see how how we can uh, examine volumes and stuff uh, which are uh, in, in CloudStack, but how can we see those uh, how, how, how can we see those on Ceph cluster? So this is just example of one volume root volume. It has a certain ID if you do, just do the RPD uh, specifying the pool minus P CloudStack. If you just do the LS command, you will have all your volumes. So one of those will be our volume, or simply just directly go RBD, RBD info and then pool slash image, which is our image from the previous picture. You will get a lot of details which you can uh, read and examine as you like. Uh, note that this, uh, this guy over here has actually a parent image. Uh, it's something similar to, uh, which I'm going to explain as a linked clones in uh, KVM, uh, sorry, with QCAL setup. Um, so what happens when you actually deploy a first VM uh, very first VM from a new template. Obviously, that template will be copied over from secondary storage to primary storage. In our case itself, it will get some specific name. That name is the name over here, if I'm 
if I did things correctly. Uh, then uh, then uh, we will do, uh, we'll create a snapshot, which we will call a base snapshot, give it some, um, let's say hard-coded name effectively, but name is obviously not important, protect that snapshot, and then create child images, or actually we'll use the clone command to create effectively the volume. And this FEB0 is our volume, which is created uh, from the specific image and we say at the snapshot name. So that's how it works in CloudStack. Uh, if you like to, um, on, in, well, in Ceph, uh, when using with CloudStack, if you want to, if you want to find all your instead of using database, which would be an obvious way to do it, uh, you can uh, list all the children uh, images of your template, which is the first one, but of that template snapshot effectively. You will have a bunch of those and one of those will be your image over here. So let's see how you can reproduce this just for sake of, you know, if you have nothing else to do, instead of watching a movie, you can do some exercises. Right, so you will, uh, what happens effectively that um, uh, we will on KVM side, we will use Camo image to import, uh, well, import, convert or whatever, let's say, in some way to import uh, the QCOW2 image, which is uh, sitting on the secondary storage. So Camo image is connected to NFS mount and point, it is, it is doing the camo image convert command, reading from QCOW2 uh, QCOW file, writing uh, to a specific uh, file on, on, uh, on Ceph storage, for sake of simplicity, just create empty volume. We will create a snapshot and give it a name. We will then protect that specific snapshot and then we will do rbd clone command which is effectively creating linked clones in, in some way if you like. We define the source, pool slash image, at that image uh, snapshot and then we say the destination is again same pool but my vm volume and that's how it works now if you want to reverse that let's observe the last line you cannot really remove the template file because it has snapshots you cannot remove snapshots because those are protected and you cannot unprotect the snapshot because it has child images. So you do everything in reverse. Delete all the child images, unprotect the snapshot, delete the snapshot, and finally delete the volume. Right. Uh, other quotes, hacking if you need to do some low-level actions, but hopefully you will actually get access to inside the VM. There are options to actually uh, map uh, what we say map or let's say connect. Uh, RBD image to uh, host uh, physical or virtual machine doesn't matter. Uh, you can use kernel client, which I really don't understand why, but it's always lacking with possibilities like severely. I was using client uh, kernel 5.0 with whatever, you know, self client is in there. It couldn't speak to Mimi cluster with all these exclusive locks and stuff. And it's, it's regarding that because I was recently working on that, mm -hmm. it, uh, it's due to the image features that it supports. And uh, recently the 5.3 kernel version supports all features. 5.3? Yeah, 5 of which version of, of cluster? Mimic no, or...? No, 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 it's, uh, it doesn't have to do with Ceph, it's about the, the, the kernel client okay, yeah. on the Linux. So if you try okay. to map, it will say mismatch feature, yes, because yeah. it doesn't support all features. If yeah. it disables some features... Then it works, yes, yes. That, that's fine, but uh, you know, you no, prob no. probably will not want to they, disable... On August, they, re they released uh, the latest kernel with the... All the features Excellent. So th that's an update because I was doing a testing and then a blog post with uh, with kernel 5.0, maybe four I months ago. Excellent. That's 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 good news. So, uh, so yes. So you can uh, uh, you know uh, map an image you know pool slash image with a RBD client, uh, which you don't have to need uh, previously um, available, and it will effectively map devices slash dev slash rbd zero and that's just another block device you can do whatever the hell you want with it right uh, optional uh, if uh, well now we heard that it's actually fixed but in my case I, I really wasn't able to consume all the features of the image with exclusive locks and stuff like that so I was saying you know I was checking you know what's the other way to mount it you can use the rbd nbd uh, which does it obviously require the specific uh, tool from the Ceph repo and it also uh, requires that you uh, load the NBD module. Keep in mind that for some reasons that I really cannot understand, with CentOS 7 the NBD module is not available with the stock kernels, so you can either compile it, copy over and stuff like that, or you can simply install something like L repo kernel for CentOS and it will have the NBD module and a bunch of additional things, uh, but it's again built against the official spec file which 
address with some more uh, let's say stuff in it and uh, yeah then, then you would use the RBD NVD map and again the image will appear as slash dev RBD zero uh, it's, it's usually it's using obviously uh, NVD driver in the background uh, and libRBD as the user space uh, client uh, to to the uh, image additionally you can use camo nbd as well to connect the uh, same stuff say uh, you know a requirement you need to mod probe nbd uh, and that's the yeah, that's the way to connect image as a local physical device as a raw, raw device and then you can mount it uh, if it's already existing image linux image and stuff like that um, you could do camo image info uh, and, and observing the details uh, uh, of uh, if you want actually to use, let's let's put it this way, if you want to use camo image info, convert, whatever, uh, to operate in volume just to do info or maybe convert it, uh, you need to be able to speak to uh, Ceph, uh, to the pool and the image itself. Uh, now, in order to do this, you do need to you need to have Ceph configuration files. Uh, so this very simple uh, one-liner uh, is actually, as you can see, the opposite of a very long and a bit ugly command, uh, which is what we actually do use via cloud stack code, but it's more appropriate in sense of you know clear cl clear the directions which monitor host to contact. Contact this monitor host, Ceph monitor. Authentication support is Cephix. Uh, or, or whatever you pronounce that. Uh, the ID, uh, which is, well, let's say, kind of a username, but it's not obviously a username, from the client keyring is cloud stack, and the key itself is whatever the key is. And this way, uh, you only need to have your uh, uh, libRBD installed uh, this way, sorry, only libRBD installed on your KVM nodes or whatever nodes are accessing. So you know all the secrets, routes, if you like, directions to contact Ceph clusters, you just need the actual uh, libRBD uh, library to do that. And that's that's how you can, uh, you know, access uh, things uh, in... Uh, how you can access uh, volumes via camo image. Uh, right. Uh, I have around 10 minutes or so. Uh, some limitations with Ceph, but those are not related strictly to Ceph, is that we don't support full VM snapshots. Uh, with KVM, when you operate KVM, uh, you can create VM snapshots only if you're using QCOW2 files on, some, on top of some file system, whatever it is. So if you're not running QCOW2 files, if you're passing through raw block device in some sense to VMs or, you know, really passing through VI, SCSI or whatever, or maybe you have a local raw device, uh, KVM doesn't support VM snapshots uh, with that. Uh, there is no support for the storage heartbeat file. That's a uh, cloud stack property where it writes every minute or so to the cloud, st to the storage. And if it cannot write, it says, okay, I assume the storage is the big, big one, reliable. I'm not reliable. Let me restart myself uh, to, you know, uh, which is obviously something you, you need to pay attention but I believe that there will be something soon. Um, currently it's not possible to really restore a volume from a snapshot. Uh, with CloudStack up to 4.11 you were, you, were, you were not anyway able to uh, restore a volume from a snapshot. You need to go to create a template from a root volume snapshot template and then spin a new VM and in this way restore your resource. That's a lengthy process or maybe configure data volume snapshot uh, convert it to or create out, out of it the new data volume and attach it. So it's creating new resources. It's not really there is no there was no possibility to restore. Now in 4.11, if you're running uh, KVM with NFS, uh, you are actually able to click the restore button uh, because the the initial uh, volume snapshots will stay on primary storage. But there are some uh, bugs which um, I will mention maybe in my second presentation. Unfortunately, 4.11 there is garbage left all, all over the place. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's something to keep in mind. And also, just when you are comparing KVM with NFS, now you are having uh, KVM and Ceph. You do have two libraries in between. This is the uh, you know uh, user space uh, client libRBD and Rados Java, which initially Rado wrote, which is uh, Rados, which is Java bindings to communicate to Rados for some snapshots operations, I guess, right? It is some stuff which Defer doesn't support. Exactly. So you need to handle them yeah. through through uh, uh, in a different way. Uh, learning curve, uh, this is not NFS <laughs> for, for sure, so you need, really need to understand how things work under the HUD. It's very easy to install the cluster, you follow this silly POC that I maybe shared, or you do some more uh, uh, better deployment in production with Ansible, <coughs> Ceph Ansible or whatever, but you do need to be able to, uh, you know, jump in when the, when the problems might arise. They don't arise frequently, especially if you have everything configured properly, but you do need to understand how the things uh, works on a lower, lower layer, so either do some uh, train some stuff seriously about Ceph or 
contact video for help or god forbid red hat because of different things um Right, so that, that's about learning cur learning curves. Something to definitely uh, pay attention to. Uh, I thought I was, you know, kind of good with Ceph until a certain point when I had issues and I had no idea what to do. So try to not be in my shoes. Uh, performance considerations: uh, it does work on commodity hardware. You can run it on ARM processors if you like, on Raspberry Pi or whatever. But don't expect miracles. You saw examples from Vido. Effectively, most of his or all of his, his clusters are SSD based, with some exceptions. The thing is uh, that latency penalty, uh, any distributed storage in, uh, increases some latency. It takes time to write over the network to two additional OSDs, send back acknowledgement to a primary OSD, and then send back acknowledgement to the client. Uh, penalties, uh, uh, when, when you say how much is it's, the, the, the native latency is multiplied, uh, the penalties are pretty huge. Uh, you, you saw some numbers from Windows 0 0.8 milliseconds or something, but keep in mind that the NVMEs have latencies from anywhere from 20 to 100 microseconds, and here uh, Widow was mentioning 800 microseconds. So the penalty itself, because of complex architecture, is let's say huge, but these are actually extremely nice uh, latencies uh, that you can obse or, um, uh, observe with Ceph. In my, uh, some of my clusters previously, in my previous company, I was observing th something in this range, 10 to 30 milliseconds, which is awful for performance. And never, never, ever consume <sighs> consumers' SSDs for uh, whatever kind of things. They will fail, not, they will not wear out, they will simply fail, and you will have like two megabyte partition. I have a story to share, but not now, because I'm pretty tight with time. Um, and also, Ceph was kind of unofficially, obviously, considered unstable, uh, so, sorry, unsuitable for any more serious uh, random I.O. Uh, workload uh, until maybe two, three years ago. And this is actually backed up by checking reference architectures from uh, Red Hat and Quanta Technologies or some other vendors, where they have all the benchmarks with sequential performance, which are awesome. And then in... Um, all the vendors are missing uh, any kind of random uh, benchmarks and even for on the quanta technology specific um, reference architecture document it was written that Ceph is not yet suitable for really kind of considered suitable for random IO but that being said that was like three years ago things can co considerably change uh, with the introduction of blue store and many other uh, improvements uh, related or actually not related to blue store in in the last two three years so you can now actually uh, run it on pure ssd slash nvme clusters which is obviously what uh widow mentioned uh throughput is increased from anywhere from 440 to 300 percent for some edge cases uh red rados gateway workloads latency has been reduced dramatically uh we you can unleash the full performance of ssds and nvmes which you could not if you were running like hammer hammer release or something like that also we have explicit memory management because boost runs in user space so you can limit uh roughly limit amount of uh, memory that uh osd i can consume uh, we do support checks some compressions and stuff like that uh i assume due to architecture um uh, limitations if you like or simply architecture or design of the architecture we are still reading uh, data only from the primary OSD replica if you have a replica size of three you have your primary uh, replica or let's say a primary object on one OSD and another two replicas we are always reading from the primary OSD which probably will not change I guess right uh, that's uh, pretty much it uh, Again, this is also POC, but with a really step-by-step copy-paste, copy-paste, copy-paste guide if, uh, if you like to really play with Ceph and CloudStack and when you actually are grown up enough, you will not even consume anything from there. You will use more appropriate uh, tools for production setups. Right, that's it from my side. Any questions, guys? Okay. All right, thank you. Andrea.